to, to help and, and support the abortion law reform. I mean, mm. that's, that, that, that is, you know, and everybody who knows Andrew Little will say that's just, you know, typical of his leadership traits, but that's good, you know, leadership that, yep, needs support, need help, I need to be collaborative and non-partisan about this issue, and it's an important one to take the, our populace and our voters mm. through. Very interesting discussion indeed. Gosh, uh, might go back and listen. What... Uh what, what makes a good leader? Debbie says rangatira means one who weaves people together. Um, mm. So there you go. Uh, and Liz says, I left school at age 14, worked in a factory, ended up owning my own businesses, married at 18. You can cut your own tracks if you want it bad enough. So there you have it. Now, on the back of Lorna Thornber's article and stuff about New Zealand's overrated attractions, now comes one about New Zealand's best oddball attractions. There's Demolition World in Invercargill, uh, where highlights include a medieval banquet where figures and faded glad rags sit around the remnants of a supper. There is Fantasy Cave in Danny Verk, yes. a, a fairy, car, fairy tale castle decorated in Duracell, intricate displays. One local who made a film about it calls it New Zealand's answer to Disneyland. Do you want to know something really funny about that? Yeah. Because I drive through Danny Verk a lot and there's a sign for the Fantasy Cave and in the corner it says, this sign is sponsored by the Tararua Funeral Company and I'm thinking, does that mean the kids go in there and never come out? <laughs> I'm well, not sure. Well, one local said of it, uh, to quote, I don't think I've ever met anybody go out the back door disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> It's a T-shirt. Oh, and Dave's Den is in Danny Verk as well. Ah, Dave's Den, 8,000 8, cars, model cars. Well, and also, to you have the Tip Top Factory, the Power Shell House, and the big sausage in Tuatapere. Uh, and we've got a lot of big things here, don't we? We've got a big carrot, big fish, a big sheep. So, a favourite oddball attraction. Will you start first, Catherine? Was there, was there a favourite one as a child? Or yes. What? My, my favourite one as a kid was... Um, this, I can't, was it called Fantasyland? And it was in mm. Hastings. Mm. And, you know, when I, was a, when I was a kid, I always sort of wanted to go to Disney, Disneyland. I always thought that would be amazing. And this thing came, it was like a big playground in Hastings called Fantasyland. But it was, it was not very good. And it had no actual rides. It was just kind of, you know, a slide <laughs> and a sort of a slightly <laughs> castle-y sort of thing. So it was totally <laughs> rubbish. <clears throat> But it was the thought of going to Fantasyland which made it all worthwhile. <laughs> I just I want to find out more about you know I, I couldn't find any photos. I need to go and research this more. Well, our listeners will know or, or yeah. put them on, the, on, on Twitter at the panel RNZ. Does Fantasyland still exist? It definitely doesn't <laughs> exist anymore. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, what about what about you, um, Vita? Um, <clears throat> I always wanted to see the powerhouse. Yeah. Well, I mean, being raised in uh, in a Samoan household in Glen Innes, you know, in state housing, uh, um, our our you know great trip was you know when Dad put us in the van and we crossed the Harbour Bridge, you know, over to the shore to see how other folks live. Oh, and then we turned around and came back over the bridge again, and that was fun. <laughs> I kid you not, no, the Harbour Bridge was... was that, that, uh, was the, that was that the was thing. That was the memory, as a child, in terms of a childhood memory, That the Harbour Bridge Wonderful. was like, wow, yeah. this is awesome. That is really true, because we it's lived true. in Wellington, we used to go yeah. up, and the Harbour Bridge was amazing, and also I remember going to my uncle's funeral, and I, you know, I was like five years old, but the highlight was that the KFC had just opened, <laughs> the first ever KFC <laughs> had opened in Auckland, and we went there, and that's what I well, remember. My highlight was uh, coming in from Manarewa, going downtown, and going in, into downtown, there was a bridge across the street. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Peter Fowler for you. Catherine Robinson, you've been wonderful this afternoon. Love it, love it. Very good indeed. Uh, I'm Wallace Chapman. Uh, thanks, Emil, for putting the show together and the week. See you next week. No mai, hari mai, o te hotaka, o te ahi, ahi. Welcome to Checkpoint, I'm Alex Perite. it's RNZ National. Coming up tonight, the DHB of dysfunction and delayed diagnosis. The Southern DHB roasted again, this time for colonoscopies. The Chief Medical Officer fronts for yet another mea culpa. This while Hutt Hospital in Wellington has a serious shortage of midwives, low morale and high stress levels. The Green Party turns up at Iho Mātao today, piling more pressure on the Prime Minister to take a stand. The latest in the war on plastic, give the fake flowers and plastic props a rest when you're laying your loved ones to rest. That's the message from those protecting our oceans. Who are the booziest Kiwis? The results from a Lancet study might surprise you. And a real nut job. We speak to the man who painted a portrait of the Prime Minister on an almond. 
RNZ News at 5. Kia ora ko Susana Leata with the NA. The police have made concessions with protesters at Ihumatao, giving them more space to cope with growing numbers. Superintendent Jill Rogers says police are pleased with the peaceful nature of the action so far. There have been no further arrests at the site since Wednesday. However, a group were arrested last night trying to block the main highway to the airport. Ms Rogers says the police have given protesters full access to one of the paddocks in anticipation of further people arriving this weekend. She says police and protesters also agreed to access through the cordon to allow the police to remove some of their vehicles and one of the protest organisers to recover their vehicle. Jill Rogers says police's role continue hold to be holding the law and preventing any breach of the peace. A highly critical report into bowel services at the Southern District Health Board shows patients are dying of cancer because of management failures. The review released today by the board describes a state of inter-service warfare between specialists in Dunedin and Southland hospitals and long delays for patients to get diagnosed. Christchurch surgeon Phil Bagshaw says the DHB has one of the highest incidents of colorectal cancer in the country, one of the highest rates of advanced cancer and emergency surgery for bowel cancer but one of the lowest colonoscopy rates. Those facts in themselves mean that they have lost the battle in the war against bowel cancer and that uh, people should be taking responsibility for it. I think senior people in the DHB have known about that for a long time and they just have not addressed those issues. Phil Bagshaw, who co-authored the review, says the DHB does not appear to be delivering on its promises to implement the report's recommendations, including dealing with toxic working relationships. Senior doctors are critical of the time it's taken the Hutt Valley District Health Board to address severe understaffing at the Hutt Hospital. The DHB today released a report into serious midwifery staffing shortages at the hospital following an Official Information Act request by RNZ News. The report says midwifery staffing levels at the DHB are the lowest in the central North Island. The Executive Director of the Association of Salaried Medical Specialists, Ian Powell, says there's also a shortage of senior doctors and its managers have known about both. It's a, a strong criticism of this, the leadership of the Hutt Valley District Health Board that it was necessary to commission a review when the information about the pressures on the service, the understaffing, were known within the service. Ian Powell. Nine people have been arrested in a major drug bust in Northland. Police searching properties, mainly in the Whangare district, have come up with a haul of Class A drugs, stolen property and illegal firearms. The four-day operation involved 150 police staff from Auckland and Northland, including the armed defenders squad. The teams searched properties in the Feki Valley, Hukere Nui, Helena Bay, Raumanga and Puwera. They found $60,000 worth of stolen property and drugs, including heroin, cannabis and methamphetamine. They also recovered two tasers, a magnum pistol, a shotgun and two semi-automatic rifles now classed as illegal. The three women and six men arrested in the raids will appear in the Whangare and Manukau courts over the next fortnight. Nationals leader Simon Bridges is predicting a new political party will emerge closer to next year's election, which could act as a potential coalition partner. The opposition party is holding its annual conference in Christchurch this weekend. Earlier this year, the National MP Alfred Ngaro ruled out speculation he might set up his own Conservative Values party. But Mr Bridges says he wouldn't discount the possibility of another party arising quickly, which could work with National. I don't subscribe to the view that we need to see those now. I do believe what I've always believed, that actually much closer to the election you can, uh, and I think personally we will see things shape up. Simon Bridges says he'll indicate early next year which parties National would be prepared to work with in a government. Wellington's Polytechnics, Welltech and Fitirea are laying off staff. The institutes have made financial deficits in each of the past two years and their student enrolments have fallen. The institute's chief executive, Chris Gosling, says their ratio of teaching staff to students is now too high. At the moment, the sector average is about well, 1 to 20 student to teaching ratio. At Fitirea and Welltech, we're currently around about 15 to 1, and so that's you know, that's obviously driving part of our financial challenges because our revenue is directly dependent on our student numbers. That's gone down and we need to respond to that.
Chris Gosling says the exact number of redundancies is yet to be determined, but about 70 positions would have to go in order to reach a 1 to 20 ratio. It's five past five. The All Black skipper Kieran Reid appears to have shut down talk of a switch to the blind side. Reid took the team through their captain's run at Wellington Stadium this afternoon as they finalise preparations for tomorrow night's sold-out test against South Africa. Reid starts at number eight, his normal position, but many pundits have suggested he move to flanker to allow the inform Adi Savia to start at the back of the pack. Reid says he'll do anything to help the All Blacks, though it's clear where he wants to play. Oh, look, I'll do whatever for this team, but, yeah, right now it's at number eight, and, you know, I'm excited to be playing there. It's, you know, the role I want to be playing, so uh, we'll see see what happens later in the year. But, yeah, I'm certainly just, just excited to be on the track for the first time this year in a black jersey, so can't wait. Kieran Reid. Meanwhile, Otago have successfully defended the Ranfurly Shield for the second time this season, beating neighbours North Otago 49-14 to in Oamaru. Ireland are tantalisingly close to an historic test cricket one over England, heading into day three of their match at Lords. England will resume this evening on 303 for nine in their second innings, with a lead of just 181. If Ireland should pull off one of the biggest test shocks ever, it would rival their 2011 World Cup win over England and vindicate them being given their test status in 2017. The defending champion New Zealand women's basketballers will be looking to make it three wins from three games at the William John. Jones Cup in Taiwan tonight when they take on Chinese Taipei B. That's the news. Tonight on Nights, drum and bass agents Concord Dawn select the mixtape. Country Life is brought to you by the letter C for Charolais cattle and the letter B for beef, which is what they end up as. Breaks Co-op is our Friday Night Live act and because this week's element is hydrogen, our sonic tonic is brought to you by the number one. On nights with me, Brian Crump, after the news at 7 on RNZ National. Now the short forecast from Met Service to midnight tomorrow. Northland showers. Auckland, Coromandel Peninsula, Waikato, Western Bay of Plenty and Gisborne. Showers easing tomorrow morning but clearing from Bay of Plenty and most of Auckland. For the remainder of Bay of Plenty and Central High Country from Waitomo to Manawatu, also Hawke's Bay and Wairarapa, fine with cloudy areas, isolated showers about the ranges. Horo Whenua and Kapiti Coast to Wellington, fine today, some cloud tomorrow. Marlborough, Nelson, Buller, Canterbury and Otago, fine apart from areas of low cloud or fog morning and night. For Westland, fine today, cloud increasing tomorrow and showers developing south of Aoraki, Mount Cook. Southland, fine today, cloud increasing tomorrow, rain developing about Stewart Island. Fiordland, cloudy, patchy light rain becoming heavier and persistent tomorrow. Chatham Islands, cloudy periods with one or two light showers tomorrow. RNZ National, funded through New Zealand On Air. It's now eight minutes past five. Thanks very much, Susanna. Alex Perita here joining you for Checkpoint for the next hour and a half. Bowel cancer patients in Southland have suffered unacceptable delays, waiting months and even years to be diagnosed because of major failures at the Southern District Health Board. A damning independent report describes a state of inter-service warfare between bowel specialists in Dunedin and Southland hospitals, which it says means patients in Southland get a poorer service than those in Dunedin. By the time some patients got their colonoscopies to diagnose their cancers, they were already dying and could only be offered palliative care. The report's co-author, Christchurch surgeon Phil Bagshaw, spoke to our reporter Ruth Hill. They've got one of the highest incidences of colorectal cancer. They've got uh, the highest incidence of uh, spread beyond the bowel at the time of diagnosis, the highest incidence of of emergency surgery and one of the lowest rates of colonoscopy. I mean, those facts in themselves mean that they have lost the battle in the war against bowel cancer and that uh, people should be taking responsibility for it. I think senior people in the DHB have known about that for a long time and they just have not addressed those issues. So what does the Southern DHB have to say about this? Well, I spoke to its Chief Medical Officer, Dr Nigel Miller, and asked him to explain why the service at the DHB is so deficient. We've encountered quite a lot of problems in Southern, and our, our process is to get through them all and resolve them. One of our principles is to be as open as possible, so people know what's going on. So therefore you hear, hopefully, uh, quite easily and straightforwardly about the problems we're having. Yes. Now, we, we, you know, we appreciate you're upfront about that. The, the, the situation, that, as we can see from the report, is that you've got one of the highest incidences of colorectal cancer, 
one of the highest rates of it spread beyond the bowel. I'm just reading off a list here. There's two to go. One of the highest rates of emergency surgery for that type of cancer and one of the lowest colonoscopy rates. So the stats show that while you've got many, many cases of it, you've got one of the lowest, I think the second lowest colonoscopy rates in the country. I think maybe the third highest incidence of that type of cancer. It's not a good look. Well, I, I don't think you can draw a conclusion that one causes the other. I quite agree. We've got work to do around our colonoscopy system. However, I would say we do a large number of colonoscopies, almost all of them, almost all, except for a small number we're, we're looking into, compared to the several thousand we do, um, have uh, met the targets and been within the government's guidelines and used the guideline system. And so that part of the system is performing relatively well. We recently started the screening program um one of the second i think second or third dhb to do that and um that's running really well we've got one of the highest uptake rates 72 percent and including a very similar or slightly higher rate for maori which is which is quite extraordinary achievement and Mm. we're continuing to work on that we take these sorts of things really seriously yeah, but Dr. Miller, the first answer you gave was that you're going to be upfront about it, and the second answer is you seem to be gilding the, the lily about the, the real situation there. I mean, the, the study looked at 20 cases, 10 of which had unnecessary delays, and just like we've seen in the past with people who've had delays to urgent care, they've, they've had some, the, in some cases, permanent damage. H- how does that make you feel about the service that you're running there? Look, I, I, I can't feel anything but really um, uncomfortable and distressed to hear that patients could be harmed in our care. And I, I agree with you entirely about that. That's why we're determined to keep working on these things, to make sure we're as open as possible so people know what's happening. However, I will say again, there's a very small percentage, a minute part of our colonoscopy system that we're looking into. However, the reviewers, unfortunately, could only get through 20 cases. So therefore, we're going to take this further mm. and look right through a whole series more cases and as well as that, not just looking at cases where concerns have been raised, looking at other cases to make sure things have been top and properly. And where we find opportunities to improve, we certainly will. OK. They, at least the people that wrote the report seem to think that one of the causes here is, is, is staffing issues. They're talking about poor communication, dysfunctional relationships. Uh, the feedback to staff is through incident reports instead of direct communication. It doesn't sound like a wonderful place to work. We've also got serious staff disputes, and some staff say that this kind of thing impacts on the ability to recruit you know, senior specialist staff, and also it's having an impact on patient care. What's the issue there amongst the staff? Oh, well, I, I, I quite agree that, that where we have uh, poor relationships between staff or strained relationships, that um, diminishes the effectiveness and puts our services at risk. And that's a really important thing for us. We do have a very active program about improving relationships. For this particular issue, we'll be calling on um, an expert to come in and spend some time working bet- between the various groups to improve relationships. We've already spent time, and, and one of the recommendations from the report was to engage the surgeons directly in the assessment process for colonoscopy, so who needs colonoscopy. So they will now be directly engaged in that, and that's really encouraging. I'm looking mm. forward to having their input in that so they can feel they're actually part of the system. The challenge for colonoscopy is to make sure we provide it for the right people. If we end up providing too many for the wrong people, we run back to where we were and where many places in the country were in the past where there were lar- large waiting lists. And that also causes quite considerable harm. Mm. So what are you going to do? Because you said last year that you would put in place all the recommendations and if not, you'd explain why. Some of the recommendations have made is, to, well, one of them is to appoint this senior medical uh, staff. It sounds like from what you've just said, you're going to do that. But also it talks about following the national guidelines so that people who are initially uh, denied a, a endoscopy um, for, for, you know, for, 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 for bowel cancer, um, they'll be able to get a, a, a second opinion. They'll be able to actually yeah. maybe so that, have that, a follow-up if a specialist thinks it's worthwhile. That, Are you going to do that? That's what, that's what we were saying. I was just saying. So the, the situation in Southland will be moved to where, where a, um, a colonoscopy is, is requested and it's uncertain about whether, whether it's the right thing. Then that goes to now two specialists, a gastroenterologist and a senior surgeon, to look at that between them and make a decision about whether that colonoscopy should be conducted or not. And one of those, of course, is a surgeon to make sure they're part of the decision-making process around 
um, making sure we provide colonoscopy with the right people and the right times. Another thing the reporters said is that it just took so long to get the information for this report, not just from your DHB. Uh, but what's the issue there in terms of being able to get the information? Because you, you said you're going to look further into this and that 20 cases is just not enough. That sounds reasonable. Yeah, well, so, so, if you so, want 100 so what, cases, it's going to so, take forever and a day to get the, the, the so data that you need. First of all, um, the challenge for us is me medical records these days are mixed. They're a mixture of, um, of um, written records, electronic. And unfortunately, our reviewers didn't feel able to use the electronic section, which was challenging, and they weren't uh, doing the reviews on site. So next time we'll do it on site. Um, th th those are the sort of challenges we have to get through. And we've, we've designed a, a different system to get through the rest, which is where a senior nurse or a couple of senior nurses will go through the cases, screen out those that, that may cause concerns, and then they're looked at by the specialist. So we'll have a much streamlined system, and I'm sure that will work much better. Mm. And we'll focus just on the issue in hand. Clearly, the reviewers had other things they wanted to look at beyond that around the national guidelines and national systems, and, and I can understand their perspective on that. Um, but we need to get through the focus on the actual cases. Dr Miller, you must be getting a little bit sick and tired of coming on Checkpoint and talking to us because I've got a list here of interviews you've done with us. I won't go through all of them, but it goes back years uh, where you've been very honest, brutally honest, saying we've got to wear this and we've got to improve. Uh, th th this survey found that 30, there was a survey that was done in the report, 32.4% uh, I guess of, of, um, of the doctors indicated, or m maybe clinicians of some sort, indicated they were aware of patients they thought had come to harm as a result of having a a referral for an endoscopy declined. What do you say to those patients? Well, look, I, 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 all I can say is, is that, is that it, it's a tragedy when someone's harmed as a result of failings in our system. And I, and I can't say anything, but we will be really sorry if, where that happens to people. It is important that we're honest and upfront. I came to Dunedin to make a difference. Um, and that means um, resolving some paying a part, hopefully, in resolving some difficult and challenging problems. Well, what's been resolved, and, though? I mean, the report writers say no one's taking responsibility here. Is it, is it time that you took responsibility or someone took um, responsibility? Well, I, I, I don't think I haven't, have said I have not taken responsibility. I'm definitely responsible, absolutely, because I'm the Chief Medical Officer and that's my job. Um, and my job is to help, help get through these things and get them resolved. But can you understand why the public might be a little bit cynical about this? That because it's just, we're hearing the same thing over and over again. Is there a missing piece here that we need to fit, to fit into the to the puzzle? Well, like, is it funding? I, 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 is it is it someone who can get the job done? Well, I, I I hope I'm doing a reasonable job. If people don't believe I am, then I'm sure they'll find somebody else. Meanwhile, I'll keep on working to make a difference. The challenge with this is, you know, that some of the things we've been open about, we had the problems with ophthalmology, that would be on your list. Mm. Um, look, it was, it, we found the problem in Southern. That is not a problem unique to Southern. But we wanted to be open about it and talk about it and make sure it got properly sorted and resolved. Um, and so, so that, that's about the openness. And maybe that's harmful to us as, as an organisation, but in the long run, it's the right thing to do. If this doesn't get resolved... And we have another incidence of this where we've got a report saying people have come to harm because of these delays. Are yep. you going to offer your resignation? Look, I would resign if I thought I couldn't make a difference. And I've been asked that now at least twice on your radio show. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, and it's not just my opinion on that. I don't, I don't personally um, uh, hold sway on that. If other people I'm not, think I'm not doing a good job, I'm sure I'll be um, given the indication. Dr Nigel Miller there, Chief Medical Officer of the Southern DHB at 19 minutes past five. Uh, just quickly in breaking news, a jury has just found two men guilty of the kidnap and manslaughter of Mitchell Patterson. His body was found at McLaren Falls in July last year. Uh, there will be more in this story uh, in the news, the news headlines at 5.30. Do keep listening and tuning in. Nine people have been arrested in a major drug bust in Northland. Police who searched properties mainly in the Whangarei district region uh, have found Class A drugs, stolen property, as well as illegal firearms. Now, Detective Inspector Rhys Johnson of Northland Police joins me now on the line. Good evening to you, Rhys Johnson. Hi, Alex. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, thanks for being, being available. Um, this seems like a pretty big bust. What did you recover? 
Uh, there's quite a few large items of stolen property, mainly right. machinery-based items. So quite pleasing to get those back to commercial operators who are missing them. Um, I guess the biggest thing for us is getting these illegal firearms off the streets and mm. quite nasty pieces of uh, uh, ammunition and, and firearms there that we've taken away from these criminals. Yes, yeah, seven of them. It says in, in in your in your statement, and I believe some of them would you know are illegal under the new the new legislation. That's correct. A couple of them would be classed as the uh, the newly illegal MSSA type firearms. There's also uh, quite a nasty looking pistol there. Uh, there was some photos sent out with a press release that would be illegal, uh, regardless of the time frame. Right, this seems like a big operation, nine arrests um, across a whole lot of different properties, right? So you must have had a fair few staff on this? We did. We actually had to throw quite a number in, and so we were very lucky to get some assistance from our colleagues from the National Organised Crime Group out of Auckland. That was more a factor of the, the nature of the terrain, the massive rural properties we were dealing with, um, some in excess of 180 acres, so it did require a number of bodies. Yeah, nine, nine people, nine properties, and you're saying, what is it, 150 uh, staff were deployed on this, and um, are we expecting more on this because you're saying it's a, it's a big operation and, and it's been going for a while? As always happens with these jobs, you uncover more evidence of other offending. So our inquiries are ongoing, and I certainly wouldn't rule out more people uh, being arrested and charged. Right, and, and can you just give us an idea of the value of those drugs or how much, give us an idea of how much you confiscated? Uh, well, there's manufacturing equipment in there as well, so it's hard to place a value on that sort of thing, but, um, you know, that obviously stops the future production of drugs, which is just as important as the amount of drugs we actually found. Right, oh, great job. Uh, thanks for being with us as well. Thanks for bringing us up to date there. Detective Inspector Reese Johnson of Northland Police there, nine arrests, nine different properties um, drugs and illegal firearms. It's just coming up to 22 minutes past five. You're with Checkpoint and RNZ National. I'm Alex Perite. We are keen for your feedback. You might want to get in touch about uh, what's going on there in the southern DHB. If you are in Dunedin or Southland somewhere, uh, in Invercargill somewhere where um, and you know, you're affected by that, uh, don't hesitate to get in touch and, um, and tell us your experience. Uh, 2101 is the text. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ. Of course, we're on email, checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. You can find us on Facebook Facebook as well. Feel free to leave a comment on the live stream and uh, we'll hopefully get a chance to read your feedback out on air. The Green Party MPs have joined a growing number of protesters on the front line at Ihumatao today, calling for the Prime Minister to help bring an end to the land dispute. People from around the country have joined the protesters, or the protectors as some are calling them, who want to stop nearly 500 houses from being built on the land due to its historical and cultural significance. The Prime Minister has so far refused to intervene. She says that she backs the mana whenua who support the Fletcher Building development going ahead. Our reporter Tigani Wahura Hanganui and Cameraman Dan Cook were there today and filed this report. A mournful, desperate cry rung out from Kaikaranga as four Green MPs were welcomed onto Ihumatau. It's the closest protesters have come to politicians since an eviction notice was served to those occupying the land on Tuesday. Green Party co-leader Marama Davidson was visibly moved. Coming on as the Green Party and with my friends um, was incredibly humbling. I slept on the first night of the occupation here three years ago. I was involved supporting this campaign before I became an MP. It's not the first time the Greens have been here, it's not the first time I've been here. But seeing the commitment of these people to protecting this whenua is incredibly humbling. Marama Davidson has been a vocal advocate for protesters during their fight to prevent a housing development being built on land which was confiscated from Māori in 1863. She said the Prime Minister had the means to put an end to it. Uh, there are all sorts of ways to try and reach a peaceful resolution. That actually is up to the mana whenua, but of course, acquiring the land back is one option. A spokesperson for protesters, Hemi Pirihi, said he was grateful Green MPs made the effort to meet with protesters face to face. But he reminded them that it was the Crown who drove his ancestors away from the land in the first place. Migration and displacement since then has largely been influenced through statutory mechanisms. 
that serves to further disconnect Māori from their land and territories. Traditional support structures. And system. Cars and buses continue to arrive throughout the day, with the protest numbers swelling to about 500 people. Many of them were rangatahi and young children. One Komatua said it was important they were here to be a part of history. This is hands-on education right here. Hands-on and, and they can say 20 years from now where they were when this was all going on. I stood at Bastion Point years ago in the 70s. My kids stand at the fiscal envelope for Tainui and now they come with me today and stand here at Ihu Mātau. Representatives from Fletcher Building were nowhere to be seen today, nor was Te Wārena Taua, the spokesperson for Mana Whenua Te Kawero A Maki, who support the housing development. Today, the leader of the Ihu Mato movement, Pania Newton, made a plea for him to come to the Whenua. Our message to him is, Hara mai, uncle. Come sit with us and have a kōrero because that's an opportunity that we haven't yet had. We still love our uncle and uh, we are still open and would receive him with open arms if he came here to have a kōrero. We want to walk alongside him. A steady supply of food, water and blankets continue to flow into Ihumatau. In just a few days, this quiet settlement has formed its own community, a community that is expected to grow even bigger this weekend with no sign of a resolution in sight. Mo te hōtaka o te ahiahine, ko te aniwa, hurihanga nui, aho. At 26 and a half minutes past five, we're going to stay with Ihu Mātau and we'll go to Dunedin where about 200 chanting and singing protesters took over the streets to show solidarity with those taking a stand. Traffic was brought to a standstill in parts of Dunedin as they marched a big loop through the central city. They too have called for the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern to step up and protect Ihu Mātau from development. Our Otago Southland reporter Tess Brunton was at the protest. <laughs> Marching across State Highway 1, protesters stopped traffic for several minutes before reaching David Clark's North Dunedin electorate office to perform a haka and waiata. Several motorists, upset by the interruption, yelled abuse and made offensive hand gestures while passing the group. Rifi Toi Fenua, who joined the march which kicked off late this morning, says he hopes protesters at Ihu Mātau will be heartened by the show of support. What's brought me here today is uh, we can stand in solidarity with these brothers and sisters, but more so so the next generation don't have to go through this. Yeah, that's why I'm here, bro, so our children don't have to go through this. It's going to keep going on and on, bro. We've been doing this for 200 years, bro. When's it going to stop? Otago University Māori Student Association President Taylor Terakia says it's hard for many students in Dunedin to join the protests up north. The local protest was one way they could show their support. I think the big thing of this is that it's, it's a peaceful protest. Peaceful protest, full of aroha and full of hope. We're embracing all people who want to be a part of this, not just Māori. And going forward, that's, that's the way we should be tackling issues is together. It's understood police were unaware of the group's intentions to march on the octagon. They arrived on the scene shortly after midday and escorted protesters through the city and directed traffic. They wouldn't comment. It was a peaceful but disruptive protest. As they wound their way through the city, protesters covered the width of the road, holding banners and singing. Pausing for a moment, they stopped for a rest and passed out apples and water, sitting in the middle of a busy State Highway 1 intersection and creating a traffic standstill. Kiratia Smith says there should be no housing development at Iamatau. It's a pretty significant thing because it does disrupt a lot of traditions and tikanga Māori that we all practice and that we all hold close to our hearts as well. Just messing with the traditions and everything just makes it a lot harder for the next generations for us to keep it going. Eventually, the protesters made their way back in front of the Otago Museum, where they started the march more than two hours earlier to listen to speeches and chant.
Environmental Justice Orthoporty member Fiona Clements says she's disappointed with how some people have been treated at the occupation up north. I'm pretty disgusted that people have been arrested. Um, I think that um, due diligence hasn't been done by the government and that we need to really talk with all mana whenua, not just one party. While the protest in Dunedin has wrapped up, many say those taking a stand at Ihmatau are in their thoughts and they're sending aroha their way. I o te pote mō te hōtaka o te ahepo nei, ko te sprantin tēnei. It's right on half past five, coming up on Checkpoint and RNZ National, treading lightly on the earth, even when you're six feet under it. Boozy baby boomers give young people a run for their money. And happy birthday, Prime Minister. We speak to the teenage Indian artist who painted a portrait of her on an almond as a present. We'd love your feedback. Get in touch on the text 2101. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ. Facebook us Checkpoint or email checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. Business is coming up. But first, Susanna Leatawa with the headlines. A jury has found two men guilty of the kidnapping and manslaughter of Mitchell Patterson, whose body was found at McLaren Falls last year. Leon Wilson and Christopher Smith have been on trial in the High Court in Hamilton over the death of the 26-year-old, who died after being held in a chokehold in the back of a car in Hamilton in July 2018. The police say they have given the Ihumatau protesters more space to accommodate growing numbers at the disputed land near Auckland Airport. They say they have made no further arrests since Wednesday, apart from a group arrested last night trying to block the main road to the airport. The protesters have been given access to a paddock and have been working with the police so vehicles can be got through the cordon. An author of a highly critical report into bowel services at the Southern District Health Board says the DHB has one of the highest incidences of colorectal cancer in the country, but one of the lowest colonoscopy rates. The review describes a state of inter-service warfare between specialists in Dunedin and Southland hospitals and long delays for patients to get diagnosed. Three women and six men have been arrested in a major drug bust in Northland, in which the police have found a haul of Class A drugs, stolen property and illegal firearms. The four-day operation involved 150 police staff from Auckland and Northland. The teams found $60,000 worth of stolen property, drugs including heroin, cannabis and methamphetamine, as well as weapons including semi-automatic rifles. Those arrested will appear in the Whangare and Monaco courts over the next fortnight. Senior doctors are criticising how long it has taken for the Hutt Valley District Health Board to fix severe understaffing at the Hutt Hospital. A report released today detailed serious shortages of midwives at the hospital, which are the lowest in the central North Island. Ian Powell of the Association of Salaried Medical Specialists says there's also a shortage of senior doctors. Those are the latest news headlines on RNZ National. Our next news and weather update is at six. Thanks very much, Susanna. Turning now to business news, Nana Peltier joins us here. And it's a Friday, Friday afternoon. You look very excited that it's Friday. <laughs> I actually am. Why not? <laughs> Um, I'll tell you who's not excited are retailers here in Australia. They say, what, $3.5 billion lost to theft? Yeah, that's Australian dollars. So uh, for New Zealand, if you kind of estimate it, it'd be about $700 million of losses, which is quite substantial. And, you know, 57% of the losses are from their shoppers, the cons- customers. But the rest is their staff and suppliers. Oh, really? So that's, you know, a hefty loss for uh, a lot of damage control must be had there. And it's, That'd be it's, an interesting breakdown, you know, because if yeah. a lot of them are suppliers, that means that the goods aren't even making it to the, to the store. <laughs> Presumably, I guess. And it's interesting that uh, supermarkets, clothing retailers, they're hardest hit. Uh, Supermarkets, for example, lose things like meat. Mm. Uh, Well, that's not that surprising. Uh, Which is expensive. (laughs) Yes. But they also... uh, Baby milk formula. Oh, really? Yeah. That's a very competitive market. Yes, and it's being resold into the Chinese market. Mm. And then another one is um, face cream. Really? Yeah, face cream. Is it pricey? I wouldn't know. Uh, well, I don't buy mine at the supermarket, but potentially <laughs> it is, yeah. And uh, so there you go. Uh, so what are they going to do about it? I guess they're going to try and uh, find ways to make those, you know, to counter those losses with mm. uh, surveillance and so on. But ultimately, it's, you know, it's consumers who pay for that. 
and uh, they don't think they get a lot of help from the police either. There's certainly a market in uh, people who steal these goods and then, like, say, meat and uh, alcohol mm. resold to restaurants. So it's finding its way into the economy in other ways. But, yeah, it's, it's really hard on retailers who have had a pretty tough time passing on expenses mm. to con- rising costs to consumers in the past year as well. Wow. We need more people like those nice people in Kaikohe yesterday who grabbed all the cash from that lady who runs the takeaway and gave it all back to her. Oh. And she made a profit. Oh, very nice. Yes. Metro Performance Glass, it says it's going to focus more on staff and customers with little growth in profits. So what's going on there? Yeah, it's confusing. You'd think here's a, the construction sector has been booming and this is the New Zealand's largest uh, glass producer, sort of a manufacturer of glass products, so to speak. But, you know, they expanded into the Australian market after listing here on 2014. So mm. they listed on the market here, the share market, in 2014, and their list price at that time, well, the issue price was $1.70 a share, debuted at $1.75. Yeah. And i got to tell you that today they dropped 5% to 30 Seven cents. Wow. And uh, their expansion in Australia didn't work out well for them. That market's been quite sluggish. So they've decided to focus more on keeping their, their staff and their customers and less on about manufacturing and sales because the market's pretty flat. Mm-hmm. So is their profit. They made $25 million last year. That's what they're expecting to make this year. Wow. Yeah, so there you go. No growth there. Okay. And the markets, how'd they go today? Actually, the markets overall are down, and that's partly because of what happened in Europe. Mm. The central bank, there was ex- people were expecting the bank to ease interest rates, and that would have boosted the markets, but they didn't. No. So the market went, oh, well, hang on. <laughs> Maybe we have to readjust our thinking. And as a result, uh, the market fell 0.8%. So yesterday we had a gain of 08 mm. Today we that's had a drop. Bad. That's 91 points down 10, 000 to 10,808. And our dollar is trading at 66.5 US, 95.8 Australian, and 53.4 pence. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Nona. Have a very good weekend. And you. Thanks very much. Nona Peltier there, the latest in the business world, uh, coming up to 24 minutes to six. The days of using plastic flowers to decorate graves and memorials could be numbered, with mourners being urged to consider their long-lasting impacts. New research out this week shows the equivalent of a truckload of plastic has been dumped into the ocean every 38 seconds. This is over the past 10 years, mind you. Now, while much of that comes from packaging or food, bits of plastic flowers, flags, balloons and other mementos used to mark graves are also ending up amongst the waste. And as pressure to steer clear of plastics in all aspects of life mounts, environmental groups say we need to think about plastic in death as well. Our cameraman Nick Monroe went along with reporter Nita Blakeperson and filed this report. RSA Welfare Officer Matthew McMillan spends a lot of time around graves. Many years ago, um, there wasn't anybody from the RSA that the cemetery people could talk to about the um, graves and stuff. So my name got thrown forward and I was unofficially made (laughs) the spokesperson for the people who have passed on up here and the um, graves. His parents are buried here at Waikometi Cemetery in West Auckland, the largest cemetery in the country, and he keeps an eye on things around the place. Mr McMillan's noticed some big changes over the years where we used to put um, flowers onto the um, graves and that sort of, and that type of thing. And then 10 years ago they came to us and said, well, you can't do that now uh, because of the actual waterways and, and the plants dying and the cemeteries were looking terrible. It's changed now where we've come on to the uh, plastic ones now. And nearly everywhere in the cemetery there are some signs of plastic. And you can see when we come up and over the hill, oh dear. There we are, look. Heaps and heaps of plastic flowers. See, see, they've all got, you know, uh, poppies on. The actual schools did all that on Anzac before Anzac Day. Schools really come in and they put the poppies on. So, and there's a little pin on there, as you know. And where's that going to end up now? The mower goes through it and looks really neat. While previously a big advocate of fake flowers because of their longevity, he's now changed his mind. Uh, in, into the um, streams here and they just jam everything up. Um, the people trying to keep do the um, um, graves up here, they, they actually get caught up in all of their gear. They will all end up blowing down to the river, newspaper ready, down the streams. Um, flowers, down. flowers down there in, in the actual bushes now. And all of this will end up down in the um, creek. You've got to 
eels, I suppose, eels and freshwater crayfish for the area here. It's just, you know, it's just one of those, just one of those things that clogs up and all these, all these here end up in the Waitemata Harbour. It's that pollution which is prompting environmentalists to encourage people to rethink how they're memorialising their loved ones. Camden Howitt from Sustainable Coastline says they're washing into waterways and being picked up by volunteers. You, the plastic flowers, you, things like that that are used in bereavement and, and it's a sensitive subject but these things that we're using to, to mark our grief and to respect our loved ones actually are, are perhaps having a, an impact on our environment. He says it's one of many ways people need to be aware of their plastic impacts. Very, very quick wearing paper products, um, products that don't have toxins in them, so looking at the dyes and things and the materials that we, we would be leaving out there. Ideally we'd be leaving organic uh, products, so it would be things that are um, grown by nature, made by nature and made to be then uh, turned into nutrients by nature. And that's what we do with our loved ones, is we, we put them in the ground so that they can return to the earth. And, and it is sensitive, but um, the likes of things that we're leaving around need to be considered in the same way. New research out this week from the Royal Society to Aparangi says it's taken less than 100 years for plastic to become central to almost every aspect of modern life. And that's evident in death too, with the sea of plastic flowers has become an important part of the memorial ritual. In the UK, some cemeteries have banned plastic. Here, the Auckland Council says it has no restrictions on the adornments people choose to put on the graves, but they do ask them to be mindful of their long-term impacts on the environment. Matthew McMillan says changing away from plastic also has its downfalls. Real flowers can be pricey and sometimes hard to come by. The problem with the real ones is that they are you know, expensive, but the families do it. Um, the, the actual real flowers only last, um, especially in areas like this, between three days, maybe four, and then they start to fade away, then they blow out, with, you know, especially here in my, in my committee cemetery, and next thing they're scattered everywhere, so, so they make the whole area look like a tip. A heck of a lot of people can afford 50 cents or a dollar, two dollars to get the plastic stuff, especially children and, and, and families along those lines. But Camden Howitt says there are alternatives out there and change is on the cards. Perhaps trying to find uh, a product that is natural but uh, is in, in high supply, so perhaps um, uh, things that are weeds but also have nice flowers on them. I'm not a botanical expert myself, but uh, it would be easy to find Google weeds that have flowers and, and find those because they, are, uh, they can be beautiful but they also can be problems and so you might be helping to solve that at the same time. The scale of it is it's a huge and urgent problem um, but the scale of solutions is huge too. There's a lot out there we can do. For Checkpoint, Nita Blake person. It's 18 minutes to six. Go and have a look at that uh, video report online later on. Some great pictures there from the Waikumete Cemetery there. Nita Blake person and Nick Monroe. A hard-hitting review of maternity services at Hutt Hospital in Wellington has found serious shortages of midwives, low morale and high stress levels. The external review, dated last November, was released following a request by RNZ under the Official Information Act. Our health correspondent Karen Brown has more. The review says the Hutt Valley DHB has been plagued by a chronic workforce shortage with the lowest number of full-time midwives in the central North Island. It adds there are currently 31 full-time equivalent DHB-employed midwives with nine full-time vacancies. The report says that has led to a very stressful work environment with insufficient staff to support minimum safe care and care rationing. But the new chief executive of the Hutt Valley DHB, Fiona Dugan, says she has been assured there is no safety risk to women or babies. I'm acting on the advice that I have received from the clinical leader for the service who assures me that women and babies are safe at Hutt Valley DHB. The review also says there's a high rate of caesarean sections at 41%, adding a recent study found a direct link between such rates and staff shortages generally. As well, of 32 lead maternity carers or LMC midwives working in the community, nine had left in the past two years, adding extra stress to hospital staff and services. Ms Dugan says the review was done so they could understand where services could be improved and the DHB is committed to doing that. 
Undoubtedly, we have vacancies, and for me, it is an absolute priority to understand how we can recruit to those. We need to work with the rest of the country. There's a shortage of midwives in New Zealand in general, and we also have a high proportion of women using our service who have very complex needs. RNZ understands staff have been deeply worried about the situation for months, and Ms Dugan confirmed a community midwifery leader has resigned. I first met with her last night and I'm not clear as to whether she has resigned because of the specific issues outlined in the report. The Hutt Valley DHB's Clinical Director for Women's and Children's Health, Chris Adams, concedes the review findings are concerning. It is a worry. I think whenever health services have resourcing which isn't optimal, it does pose a potential risk to services and that's what's been identified and that's the strength of this report. The College of Midwives Chief Executive Alison Eddy says Hutt is not the only DHB with serious midwifery shortages. I mean, there are pockets of shortage in various areas in either the community or in the hospital, certainly Dunedin, I understand, has a shortage of community midwives at the moment. County of Manukau, um, Auckland DHB also, um, I think those DHBs are also struggling with adequate midwifery workforce. She says ironically latest workforce data shows a record 3,309 midwives have practising certificates. But she says high stress environments in DHBs like Hutt are putting many off. The staffing levels are inadequate. Uh, the acuity and needs of the woman seeking the service is, has been increasing for a number of time and the base staffing within the hospitals, of which this is a good example, have not been reviewed sufficiently. I mean, this report says that the midwifery-based staffing levels for the maternity service have not been formally reviewed for at least 10 years. The Health Minister David Clark said today the midwifery workforce has been stretched across New Zealand for some time and it will not be fixed quickly. Midwives say a recent pay settlement for their Maris union will help, but it will take time. Mō te hōtaka o te ahi ahi, ko Karen Brownahou. It's 14 minutes to six. Boozy baby boomers are giving young people a run for their money when it comes to hitting the bottle. A recent Lancet study predicts that New Zealand's per capita alcohol consumption is set to increase over the next decade. And a public health lecturer is warning it will be people over 50 driving the consumption in New Zealand, not young people. Now, we got the youngest reporter we could find, Katie Scotcher, to investigate. For years, young people have been labelled as being at the heart of New Zealand's binge drinking culture. But times are changing. An academic is warning in the next decade, people over 50 will be the group increasing the country's overall alcohol consumption. So we went out to ask baby boomers just how much they really knock back. These women are making no apologies for enjoying a drink. We usually have two or three glasses of wine a night. Sometimes we don't have wine, we have beer, but we do drink alcohol. Yeah, same thing. We have um, half a bottle of wine or maybe three beers a day. Every day. <laughs> Every day of the week. See how happy we are. So we're, we're people who drink and we're happy. This woman out for a Friday stroll says she has two or three glasses of wine a week. There's a group of us who meet on a Friday for drinks and nibbles every Friday. So um, they would probably be about the same. Should they? Yeah. they might have, oh no, some of them do have a glass of wine every night of the week. And then, yeah, Jen and stuff. Yeah. Oh, okay. And most of them maybe have some something to drink over the weekend, but I think most of our friends are a bit like us. Public health lecturer Andy Towers says while people under 25 still have the largest number of hazardous drinkers worldwide, that number is reducing and showing no signs of stopping. He says the rise in over 50s drinking is concerning because adults can experience greater harm from alcohol use than younger drinkers. The older we get, the harder it is to process alcohol, so that it's more toxic for us. And then the older we get, the more likely it is that we um, have developed chronic health conditions that are alcohol-related or mix poorly with alcohol. And we're probably medicated as well for those conditions. And those medications, things for chronic heart disease or for, for mental health disorders, they can very often severely interact with alcohol. Dr Andy Towers says there is legislation to limit the amount of alcohol young people can access, but there are no measures in place to protect older people. 
He suggests increasing the price of alcohol, reducing its availability and advertising could help curb the trend. This isn't going to be changed overnight. This isn't even going to be changed in five to ten years. But making those changes now changes the culture of drinking in New Zealand and changes the norms. For some older drinkers, it's life's challenges that help them quit. No, I, mean, I haven't even smoked or bloody drank since me travelled to bypass. I have, I've had the occasional drink, but I don't drink. I used to drink, you know, regular basis, you know, make a can of night, something like that, but nothing, nothing serious. And Andy Towers says for baby boomers who want to have a happy and healthy life, that may be the best example to follow. Mō te hōtaka o te ahi ahi nei. Ko Katie Scott, Chiraho. It's just coming up to 10 minutes to 6. It's all happening here before 6 on Checkpoint. We've had beer, we'll have football next and then nuts stay tuned um we've got um well and also if you do want to get in touch with your feedback you can you can text us on 2101 what do you think about people over 50 driving up alcohol consumption uh, you can tweet us at checkpoint rnz you can email us at checkpoint at rnz.co.nz we have got some feedback there coming in about the issues with the southern dhb as well as that great story from nita blake person about the plastic mementos and uh, flags and uh, flowers on graves so do stay tuned now you can't accuse the all blacks of being all sausage and no sizzle and especially not today fans got the chance to meet and greet the team at a barbecue on wellington's waterfront ahead of tomorrow's test against the Springboks. the band 660 entertained fans as the team signed autographs and posed for pictures for a banger of a morning in the capital hamish cardwell and a bag of puns went along go the abs wellington's waterfront turned into a sea of excited all blacks fans this morning Hundreds of men and women, young and old, turning out for a chance to meet the players and to tuck into a snarler cooked by one of their heroes. All Blacks lock Brody Retellick says he's geared up for a fiery game tomorrow, but first he's got to survive the heat of the barbecue, feeding 500 hungry fans. Probably harder not to burn the sausage, I think, but uh, no, it'll be a good contest tomorrow night, obviously. Um, the South Africans seen a few players here early and they've got some great depth for their squad at the moment, so um, no doubt it'll be pretty physical as always. Fans were confident about the All Blacks' chances against the Springboks, with a smattering of serene punters even greeting the morning sun with a few quiet brews. Vera Karatoa and her daughter Nee Mills were looking forward to a win and a fun weekend out. So you're looking forward to the game, yeah? Yeah, yeah, definitely looking forward to the game. Do you think we can take it out? Absolutely. 100%. 100% we can take it out, for sure. I'm hoping. <laughs> So what's the game plan, do you think, for, for this weekend? And what are you guys going to do to get geared up and get, um, you know, get in the spirit of things? Uh, champagne breakfast, and then go for a walk, and then cocktails for lunch, and then get ready for the game. One brave figure in a Springbok jersey thought the odds might actually be tipped towards his team. I think it's pretty good. We bet them last year here. Well, we've got a pretty good record against All Blacks at Wellington, so we've got a good side. And um, I don't know. I reckon it'll be close, but I reckon I'll take it maybe five or ten points. Five or ten points, that's yep. not that close. <laughs> oh, close enough to win. But Trent Ival from Hamilton has complete faith in the New Zealanders. No problem, that we'll win it. That's some confidence. Yeah, yeah, no, no, we'll win the game. What do you think the scoreline will be? 24-14. I, I, I love the specifics of, of <laughs> your certainty, eh? Yeah, a certain guy, yeah. 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 And if meeting the All Blacks wasn't enough for one day, the band 660 treated the crowd to a performance. The band's bass player Chris Mack says their new single, The Greatest, has a message to match the spirit of the All Blacks and of the nation. You know, it's quite an inspiring song. Uh, you know, it's about believing in yourself and aspiring to be the greatest. And uh, I think in a lot of ways that is the All Blacks, um, and in every single way that is New Zealand. It's, that's the New Zealand narrative. Uh, you know, we're a tiny Pacific island re in reality and yet we compete on the world stage and most often win. So you reckon you got some confidence for what's going to happen tomorrow night then? Oh, I'm not saying anything. I can't. No one's pinning this on me. So with Westpac Stadium sold out for the Rugby Championship test tomorrow evening, fans are hoping the team doesn't hit any snags. That would be the worst. For Checkpoint, Ko Hamish Cardwell, Tene. Thank you, Hamish. And this afternoon, the All Blacks went through their captain's run at Wellington Stadium, and skipper Kieran Reid says they've learnt from last year's shock loss to South Africa in Wellington, and they're braced for a springbok storm. Oh, yeah, there's always lessons you can be learnt from last year. Um, you know, and that comes back to, uh, I guess, our own approach, really, uh, and our mental approach, and, and the guys who have played in that game will certainly be feeling it again. So it's, uh, 
you know, nice to have in, in the back of your minds, but for us it's a new year and a, a new opportunity to go out here and, and play for your country. Reid was also quizzed about a possible move to blindside flanker before the World Cup, allowing an inform Adi Savia to start at number eight, and the skipper seems reluctant to shift from his favourite position. Oh, look, for myself, it'd be simple. Yeah, I, can, I could switch anywhere, to be honest, in this team and, and do it when you gain experience and, and time in the jersey. You know, it's not too hard to, to do that. Um, yeah, so it wouldn't be too hard. And, um, you know, any, any time you just want to be out on the track. But, um, look, I really enjoy playing number eight. That's where I see myself and get the best out of myself. And um, can't wait for that tomorrow. Now, our faithful RNZ rugby reporter Joe Porter, of course, was at the captain's run. I asked him a bit earlier about the fact that a not-so-important match in a World Cup year has been sold out. Yes, that's right. More than 36,000 fans will be here tomorrow night on what will hopefully be a similar evening to this. Sunny, glorious conditions in Wellington today. Of course, it is a match that doesn't have a lot on the line. No one really cares about the rugby championship this year. It means nothing in terms of the World Cup. Both teams are still trying to experiment with different lineups and settle on their first choice combination. However, there's something in the air a Springbok all black rivalry. The winner of this take game takes bragging rights into that first World Cup pool clash between the two teams and a psychological edge. The fans must feel it too. The Swingbox won here last year, a massive upset over the All Blacks. This year, they'll be hoping that the All Blacks can gain some vengeance and get them back on track and also stop the South Africans from gaining any more confidence heading into that crucial World Cup clash. So fans are excited and I think the players are too. It should be a bigger match than what on paper it should be. Yeah, so Joe, probably the most interesting thing is this uh, Richie Mawonga at first five and Bowden Barrett at full back. Um, yeah, pre, pe people are pretty excited about this. Um, it's an experiment, but um, do you get the feeling it's going to be one that's lasting and we'll, we'll see through to the World Cup? Of course, all eyes are going to be on this Richie Moanga at first five, Bowden Barrett at fullback experiment, and that's just what it is. It is an experiment. It's hard to see Steve Hansen really sticking with this combination all the way through the World Cup because you simply don't have any backup beyond these guys to come off the bench. I'd say Bowden Barrett will start at first five in the World Cup. This is his team. This is his group to run, but this is a chance for Richie Moanga to get his chance to start the game, run the cutter, get some more exposure at international level, and a tense match against, a tent, against a, an experienced and physical sprint box pack so it's just more about giving Richie Moranga experience at this top level rather than him usurping Bowden Barrett as first five. All right and um, well we're just about um, 24 hours away from kickoff more or less uh, what are your predictions for the match Joe? I think it will be quite a close match closer than maybe many people expect I think the box will come out absolutely firing they'll recite a bible passage in the players tunnel before the game and they'll come out bashing that Bok emblem with pride however I think if the All Blacks can sort of weather that storm in the first half and the last 20 minutes of the game they should be able to sp play expansively run around some of these tiring Springbok forwards and if Rich Mwanga can control the game better than Bowden Barrett did last year here at Westpac Stadium. I think the All Blacks do win comfortably by about 13 points. I don't think this will be quite as dramatic as last year with both teams experimenting a little bit more in this test. But you never know. It is a Springbok All Black rivalry and it could come down to the wire. And let's hope, because it's going to be a glorious night for rugby, so let's hope the match is fitting of that. That's our rugby reporter Joe Porter there at Wellington Stadium and basking in the sunlight. He's hoping it's going to be the same uh, tomorrow night. Uh, so it's the Springboks and the All Blacks tomorrow night at uh, Westpac Stadium. The other game in the rugby championship, of course, is the Wallabies against the Pumas from Argentina. An Indian artist who painted a portrait of our Prime Minister on an almond for her birthday today says he's going for a world record nut job. 18-year-old Aman Gulati, who lives in northern India, painted the teeny tiny portrait on an almond. He told me he's already painted the Indian cricket team, Mahatma Gandhi, and new UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson on nuts, but he's aiming for thousands more. I have a collection of uh, many portraits on almond, and I create a collection of 6,000 portraits on almond to create a new Guinness World Record. So oh, I right, so you're trying to break uh, a Guinness World Record. Yeah. How, how many did you say you have in total? Yeah, for 6,500 portraits I created, and I, at present time I created 210 portraits, and uh, I'm creating 6,500 portraits, so it takes us so many years for creating this right. uh, large number of portraits. So let but, me clarify uh, that you, you've done two... You've done 200 and you're aiming for 6,500. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. In which I create a portrait, landscape, monuments and other things also. Do, do, do people ask you for commissions, you know, to, 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 to paint them now that you've got quite a following? I mean, yeah, do you... Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. 
present time uh, the people asked for me to commission armand and i also make uh, portraits on commission work how long does it take how long does it take you to get through each nut job yeah to create a portrait on armand so it took uh, two hours because it took a uh, more difficult to work on armand armand Armin was a great sport with us. We recorded that a little bit earlier. Um, he's he's from Uttar Pradesh. That's in that's in northern India. He was explaining that it takes him two hours uh, to paint those portraits, and he's going for a Guinness World Record. He says he's done two hundred of them, and from what I could understand, he's aiming for six and a half thousand. Um, so uh, maybe, and he does say that he takes commissions. So if you want to get in touch, get in touch with us. We'll put you in touch with Armin, and uh, he might be able to send an Armand over. Um, I'll have to get through biosecurity. Um, a painted Armand portrait. He does want to come to New Zealand as well uh, to present it to the Prime Minister. He's going to um, he's going to try that out. It might be his ticket to New Zealand. Who knows? Uh, and he says it takes two or three hours, as we said. Uh, you can you can check out the. Um, the pictures, the photos now on our Checkpoint Facebook page. Um, we do have a little bit of time for some feedback um, on endoscopy and, and colonoscopies in Southland. Someone says, I waited 12 months in Invercargill. I was rated urgent, and in the meantime, they decided I didn't need one. The point is, this was decided by health professionals in Dunedin and Invercargill without even seeing me. More feedback after six. RNZ News at six. Nga mihi nui ko Susana Layata with DNA. Numbers at Ihumatao have swelled to about a thousand as many join the land protest ahead of the weekend. It's the fourth day of attempts to stop a special housing development from being built on ancestral land near Auckland Airport. The police have moved back in one of the main paddocks to allow more space for people with tents. Cars are parked right down on both sides of Oruarangi Road and there is a continuous flow of vehicles dropping off supplies. Green Party MPs joined protesters on the front line today, calling for the Prime Minister to bring an end to the land dispute. The Prime Minister has so far refused to intervene, saying she backs the mana whenua who support the Fletcher Building development going ahead. The Southern District Health Board says it is committed to fixing its problem-plagued bowel service, which has left some patients waiting months or even years for a cancer diagnosis. An independent review has criticised management for failing to deal with the problems at the DHB, which has some of the worst rates of bowel cancer in the country and one of the lowest rates of colonoscopies. The DHB's Chief Medical Officer Nigel Miller says the DHB is making a number of changes, including giving surgeons more involvement in deciding who should get a colonoscopy. The challenge for colonoscopy is to make sure we provide it for the right people. If we end up providing too many for the wrong people, we run back to where we were and where many places in the country were in the past where there were large waiting lists. And that also causes quite considerable harm. Dr Miller says it is a tragedy where someone has been harmed due to failures of care, but most of the thousands of colonoscopies done at Southern DHB have met the guidelines. Two men involved in the kidnapping and manslaughter of a Ngaro Wahia man last July have been found guilty at the High Court in Hamilton. A jury returned its verdicts a short time ago after deliberating for four hours. Leon Wilson, aged 49, and Christopher Smith, 34, were convicted of the kidnapping and manslaughter of 26-year-old Mitchell Patterson. Wilson was also found guilty of conspiring to defeat the course of justice, but Smith was found not guilty on that charge. The third defendant, Chloe Kerridge, was found guilty of kidnapping and conspiring to, to defeat justice. Mitchell Patterson died after being held in a chokehold in the back of a car in Hamilton and his body was later thrown off a bridge in the into the McLaren Falls in Bay of Plenty. The three will be sentenced in early September. Nine people have been arrested in a major drugs bust in Northland. A large police team has scoured properties across the region all week and come up with a haul of Class A drugs, stolen property and illegal firearms. Lois Williams reports. For four days, 150 police staff from Auckland and Northland have been carrying out searches, mostly in the Whangarei district, in the Whiki Valley, Hukurinui, Helena Bay, Raumanga and Puwera. They found $60,000 worth of stolen property and drugs, including heroin, cannabis and methamphetamine. They've also recovered two tasers, a magnum pistol, a shotgun and two semi-automatic rifles, now classed as illegal under new firearms laws. 
Detective Rhys Johnston says the police are pleased to have severely disrupted a criminal group. The three women and six men arrested in the raids will appear in the Whangare and Manukau courts over the next fortnight. This is Lois Williams. The police in Canada believe they're closing in on two teenagers wanted in relation to the killings of three people, including an American woman and her Australian boyfriend. They're using drones and dogs to scour harsh terrain in northern Manitoba. They were originally reported as missing, but later named as suspects in the killings. Corporal Julia Corshane says the manhunt is focused in and around the small town of Gillam. The search for Cam McLeod and Briar Schmigelski continues, and we can now confirm that there have been two established and corroborated sightings of the suspects in the Gillum area. There have also been no reported stolen vehicles that could be attributed to the suspects. At this point in the investigation, we believe they are still in the area. Julia Corshane says crisis negotiation teams are being deployed to the area. A public health lecturer says a rise in alcohol consumption among baby boomers is concerning as they experience greater harm from liquor than younger drinkers. A recent Lancet study predicts that New Zealand's per capita alcohol consumption is set to increase over the next decade. Andy Towers, a public health lecturer, is warning it will be people over 50 driving the consumption in New Zealand, not young people. Dr Towers says it's hard for older people to process alcohol. It's more toxic for us and then the older we get the more likely it is that we um, have developed chronic health conditions that are alcohol related or mix poorly with alcohol and we're probably medicated as well for those conditions and those medications, things for chronic heart disease or for, for mental health disorders, they can very often severely interact with alcohol. Dr Andy Towers. It's coming up to five and a half past six. The Springboks coach Rassi Erasmus says while the result will matter little should either side win the World Cup, this weekend's test against the All Blacks in Wellington remains important. The clash will likely decide the winner of this year's rugby championship and acts as a preview for the team's opening World Cup pool clash in Japan in September. Erasmus says no one remembers the Springboks beat the All Blacks in 2011 when New Zealand won the World Cup, but he also believes the winner of this weekend's test will have an edge in Japan. In the biggest scheme of things, one will always play down this test match and say the World Cup is the most important. But then in the same breath, it's the New Zealand-South Africa test match. So for us, it's important. And because we're playing each other in the pool matches, you know, it, it, it spices it up. So it's a spicy one. It's, a, it's going to be a close one. And I guess the team that wins will have a little bit more belief and momentum going into the first, first pool match. So it's a big one. Rassi Erasmus. Professional boxing has suffered its second death this week after 23-year-old Argentinian super lightweight Hugo Santian died from injuries suffered in the ring five days ago. Santian's death comes two days after Russian Maxim Dadashev died after suffering a brain injury in a fight in the United States last week. That's the news. Kia ora, g'day, Paul Brennan, in for Phil O'Brien this Saturday night. Saturday night requests, SNR on RNZ. Make your requests now via the Facebook group page. You can text 2101 or email satnight at rnz.co.nz. Requests 7 to 11 and there's a theme hour 11 to midnight. B-sides that became hits like this one. I'm looking forward to it. Join me, Paul Brennan, in for Phil O'Brien this Saturday night, Saturday night requests, SNR on RNZ. Now the short forecast from Met Service to midnight tomorrow for Northland showers. Auckland, Coromandel Peninsula, Waikato, Western Bay of Plenty and Gisborne. Showers easing tomorrow morning but clearing from Bay of Plenty and most of Auckland. For the remainder of Bay of Plenty, Central High Country and from Waitomo to Manawatu, also Hawke's Bay and Wairarapa. Fine with cloudy areas, isolated showers about the ranges. Horofenua and Kapiti Coast to Wellington, fine today, some cloud tomorrow. Marlborough, Nelson, Buller, Canterbury and Otago, fine apart from areas of low cloud or fog morning and night. Westland, fine today, cloud increasing tomorrow and showers developing south of Auraki Mount Cook. Southland, fine today. Cloud increasing tomorrow and rain developing about Stewart Island. Fiordland, cloudy, patchy, light rain becoming heavier and persistent tomorrow. Chatham Islands, cloudy periods with one or two light showers tomorrow. RNZ National, it's eight minutes past six. Thanks very much, Susanna. Uh, you're listening to Checkpoint with Alex Perite. The Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern is expected to make a statement on the Hi'ihumato dispute within the next half an hour. A Green Party MPs waded into the swelling protest at Hi'ihumato today with four joining protesters at the front line 
calling for Jacinda Ardern to help bring an end to the land dispute. The protesters or land protectors want to stop nearly 500 houses from being built on the land due to its historical and cultural significance. The numbers have been swelling today. The Prime Minister has so far refused to intervene, saying she backs the mana whenua who support the Fletcher Building development going ahead. Now, we'll try to bring you the Prime Minister's comments live, so do stay tuned and we'll see if there is a press conference uh, before 6.30. We'll take you there. Two men involved in the kidnapping and manslaughter of Narawahi man last July have been found guilty in the High Court in Hamilton. A jury returned its verdicts a short time ago after deliberating for four hours. Mitchell Patterson died after being held in a chokehold in the back of a car in Hamilton. His body was later thrown off a bridge into the McLaren Falls in Bay of Plenty. Now, our reporter Andrew McRae has been covering the trial and joins me now. Good evening, Andrew. Can you just take us through the charges? Yeah, good evening, Alex. Uh, yes, Leon Wilson is a former gang leader and aged 49. He was charged with, uh, along with uh, Christopher Smith, uh, aged 34. They were both charged with uh, kidnapping uh, and the manslaughter of uh, Mitchell Patterson and also conspiring to defeat the course of justice. And the third defendant, uh, Chloe Kerridge, uh, she was uh, charged with kidnapping and conspiring to defeat justice. And uh, they, uh, Wilson was convicted on the kidnapping and manslaughter charge and uh, Smith on kidnapping and manslaughter, but Smith wasn't convicted on uh, trying to uh, defeat the course of justice. And Chloe Clearage, uh, she was found guilty of both kidnapping and conspiring to defeat justice. OK, Andrew, and can you tell us uh, any detail about how the trial played out? Well, it was a two-week trial. Basically, it was along the lines of uh, the, the gang leader, Wilson. He denied being uh, the guy who had ordered that his associates go out and find Mr. Patterson and bring him in for what he described was a bit of a chat. And he also claimed that he didn't have uh, violence in mind. Uh, Smith uh, was the brother-in-law of uh, was the brother-in-law of Wilson. He uh, he claimed that uh, Mitchell Patterson was already had already been kidnapped and was probably already dead by, by the time he got into the car that uh, Patterson was in. They were taking them to uh, Leon Wilson and uh, Chloe Kerridge. She denied her part. Uh, in the kidnapping and also any uh, role in disposing of the body. That's how it basically played out. Right, and then when can we expect sentencing there, Andrew? Well, sentencing will be for the three of them on September the 6th. And it's important to note also that uh, five other people were involved in, in this uh, kidnapping and, and uh, killing of Mr. Patterson. They pleaded guilty, so didn't have to go to trial, and they will be sentenced also at a later date. So a total of uh, eight people have been found responsible for the killing of Mitchell Patterson. Wow, OK. Hey, thank you very much for the update, Andrew. That's just happened uh, this afternoon, not long before we uh, we came on air. So Andrew, bring us the very latest there from the High Court in Hamilton. Uh, just gone 11 minutes past six. Bowel cancer patients in Southland have suffered unacceptable delays, waiting months and even years to be diagnosed because of major failures at Southern District Health Board. A damning independent report describes a state of inter-service warfare between bowel specialists in Dunedin and Southland hospitals, which it says leads to patients in Southland getting poorer services than those in Dunedin. By the time some patients got colonoscopies to diagnose their cancers, they were already dying and could only be offered palliative care. Now, the report's co-author, Christchurch surgeon Phil Bagshaw, spoke to our reporter, Ruth Hill. They've got one of the highest incidences of colorectal cancer. They've got uh, the highest incidence of uh, spread beyond the bowel at the time of diagnosis, the highest incidence of of emergency surgery and one of the lowest rates of colonoscopy. I mean, those facts in themselves mean that they have lost the battle in the war against bowel cancer and that uh, people should be taking responsibility for it. I think senior people in the DHB have known about that for a long time and they just have not addressed those issues. Well, the DHB has put out a statement saying that since the report was completed in May, they've been working to ensure patients in Southland get the same treatment as those in Dunedin. It's also investing in building stronger internal relationships and it's reviewing another 102 cases. What more do you think they should be doing? We made a a whole series uh, of recommendations they relate to them and get having a, an overall plan that, so that the, the departments can work together. They need to get together with the community and get, try to get more resources. There are a whole raft of things, all constructive things that we have suggested, none of which uh, were mentioned uh, in the, um, the media release from the DHB today. It's all very disturbing. And the most disturbing thing here 
of all for me is that I don't hear people taking responsibility. I mean, in health, sometimes when you're doing your very best, things go badly. But at the end of the day, it's about people saying something's going wrong here. I, we take responsibility for it and we're going to do something positive about it. What they're doing here is just shilly shallying. Now, that was Phil Bagshaw who co-authored the report into the dire state of endoscopy and colonoscopy wait times at Dunedin and Southland hospitals. He's saying that no one seems to be taking responsibility. If you do want to listen back to a little bit after 5 p.m. this evening, we interviewed the Chief Medical Officer, uh, Dr Nigel Miller. He's been on this program a number of times uh, with a mea culpa about the state of affairs there in the Southland DHB. Um, I asked him whether he would resign Um, If this doesn't get better, he said he would. He didn't give a timeline, um, but he did say he's working very hard to improve the situation. They do keep your feedback coming in on that. It's uh, just after 14 minutes past six. It's Checkpoint on RNZ National. Now, they left hoping to get to Europe, but at least 150 people are missing. Feared drowned after a wooden boat carrying migrants capsized off Libya. The UN says it's the worst migrant ship tragedy in the Mediterranean this year. Dozens of survivors were pulled from the water by Libyan coast guards and local fishermen. The BBC's John McManus has this report. Shocked and dazed, the survivors who made it back to land thanks to the Libyan coast guard. Around 145 migrants were rescued when their boat sank. But up to 150 are feared drowned, some of the bodies already recovered. The ongoing civil war in Libya is contributing to the migrant problem. With two competing governments, as well as violent militias, law and order has broken down, allowing ruthless gangs to exploit those desperate to get to Europe. This wooden boat went down off the coast of Coms, 60 miles from the capital Tripoli. Most migrants crossing here are trying to reach Italy. The charity Med Sans Frontières says most of those on board were from Ethiopia, but there were also Palestinians and Sudanese, like this woman whose child drowned. I lost my seven-year-old child because of the organisation. Because they don't help us, they do not help migrants. I wish they could bring in a foreigner to work at the organisation here so they can see our situation. But Europe has increasingly closed its doors. Italy's Deputy Prime Minister Matteo Salvini has banned foreign-flagged NGO ships from docking at Italian ports. The Libyan Coast Guard has increased its patrols, but those it rescues are returned to detention centres condemned for their inhumane conditions. The UN Refugee Agency says that safe passageways between Africa and Europe must be opened up, or there'll be more tragedies. John McManus there at 16 minutes past six. Women's rights groups in Indonesia are claiming a rare victory after the nation's parliament approved amnesty for a victim of sexual harassment who ended up behind bars. Since 2015, school assistant Bike Newell has been fighting the charges which were filed under wide-ranging laws designed to stop slander and blasphemy online. There's hope the often misused laws will now be revised. The ABC's Indonesia correspondent David Lipson has more. With cameras swarming around her, Bike Nuril repeats the words thank you over and over as the realisation dawns her four-year nightmare is almost over. The former school assistant from the island of Lombok has been trapped at the centre of a sort of reverse Me Too moment since 2015 when a recording of her boss sexually harassing her was made public. The boss, a school principal, was never charged, but Nuril, who never intended the audio to get out, was arrested in front of her five-year-old son and locked up under a controversial law that criminalises any electronic communication that could be considered slanderous or immoral. She was sentenced to six months jail and ordered to pay around $50,000 for her an impossible sum. When the Supreme Court upheld the ruling, it cleared the way for the President to to intervene in what Usman Hamid from Amnesty International Indonesia says is an historic victory for women's rights in this country. The first time for a president in Indonesia to grant an amnesty for a non-political prisoner, and in this case, a victim of sexual harassment. So this is 
very, very important. As required by law, the President sought Parliament's approval for an amnesty. It's now been rubber-stamped with strong support from the Law and Human Rights Minister, Yasona Lauli. Failure to grant amnesty, he said, would discourage thousands of victims, maybe tens or hundreds of thousands of women with sexual abuse cases from trying to defend their rights. President Jokowi, as he's known, now awaits the paperwork from Parliament, but his previous support of Nouril suggests he will grant her freedom. Amnesty International's Usman Hamid again. To formally grant her an amnesty would send a very strong message to the police, prosecutors and courts that in the future they should protect victims of sexual harassment instead of criminalising and sending them to jail. Rights groups are now calling for a swift revision of the so-called ITE law that was used in Nouril's case and a host of other trumped-up criminal investigations. Nouril's case showed the harm and the absurdity contained in the law. And this is the right time, I think, for the parliament, for the government to revise it uh, substantially. He hopes Nouril's struggle will lead to victory, not just for Indonesian women, but for freedom of expression in a nation where speaking out of turn can lead to prison. David Lipson with that report at 19 minutes past six. The Auckland city centre is to become more pedestrian friendly, with some on-street parking being taken out and small pocket parks being built. That's actual green spaces, not car spaces. A series of trails have been announced today at High Street, where the project is going to start in October. Chen Liu reports. High Street is narrow and lined with retailers, including bookstores, clothing shops and optometrists. It runs parallel to Queen Street and is mostly one way, with only just enough width for one car. Even as the mayor Phil Goff is making his announcement, there is a warning to pedestrians spilling onto the road. For every one of these cars you see travelling up here with a single person in it, um, there are 14 pedestrians. One, you've got car congestion, but you've also got pedestrian congestion. You know, you see somebody with a disability trying to get up the narrow area of, uh, <laughs> there are, I rest my case, a, a narrow area of footpath and you see that this is not an area that is friendly for people. A university student, Patricia Wright, who often walks in the area, welcomes the proposal. I think it's too many cars parked, which means that you can't see where the cars are coming because you have to kind of look around cars, especially if there's tall cars like vans or trucks. So I think that it would definitely make it safer for pedestrians to be crossing the road and visiting different shops if they're going to be having less cars and less congestion. Briar Laurie, a seller at a children's bookstore on a street, agrees. High Street has always had such a narrow pedestrian space, especially considering how much foot traffic we get through here. And speaking as someone who works in a shop with a lot of kids in it, anything that is going to mean less chance of kids dashing out the door and in front of traffic can only be a good thing as well. A man who doesn't want his name used and delivers goods to the street regularly says it's not a good idea. It makes the delivery people a lot stressed. Yeah, you know, look at it, it's not enough loading zones. I think if they do that, it won't be good for the businesses because people can't get their stock delivered on time. The seven-month trial will begin at the northern end of High Street and will progress further up the street over time. The council says it's doing that to get feedback from residents and businesses to use in the final design. It's part of a council plan to pedestrianise more and more of the CBD over the coming years. Just coming up to 22 minutes past six, the Prime Minister is preparing to make some comments about Ihu Matao. She's just down the road at Auckland Airport, so we'll see if we can bring you some of those uh, comments if she does uh, appear soon. In the meantime, Boris Johnson has had his first full day as Britain's new Prime Minister. He promised that Brexit will make the UK the greatest place on earth. Sound familiar? In his first statement to the Commons, he said his government will throw itself into Brexit negotiations with energy, but will also turbocharge preparations for a no deal. Meanwhile, alongside all the speculation over what type of leader he will be, it's Boris Johnson's personal life, which is also the talk of the town, as CNN's Anna Stewart reports. Just as Boris Johnson made a statement of defiance in his debut address as Britain's new Prime Minister... Never mind the backstop. The buck stops here. He also made a statement about his personal life, walking through the famous black door of Number 10 Downing Street alone. An iconic moment usually shared with a Prime Minister's partner or children. But he wasn't completely alone. 
Boris Johnson's girlfriend, Carrie Simmons, watched from the sidelines. Now speculation grows as to whether she will move in, making Boris Johnson the first prime minister to live unmarried with a partner. They are going to make history by being a boyfriend and girlfriend couple moving in to that power base in number 10 Downing Street. The British media is also fascinated by this relationship, given the new prime minister's reputation for a colourful personal life. Boris Johnson is going through a divorce after a marriage of 25 years and four children. The relationship with Simmons, more than 20 years his junior, began last year. And despite the couple often living together in Simmons' London home, they succeeded in keeping their romance out of the limelight. Then the leadership contest began. Police were called to their address by neighbours who complained about a loud argument. Questions then swirled in the media about Boris Johnson's fitness to become the next Prime Minister. You're not going to make any comments at all on what happened last night? I think that's pretty, that's pretty obvious from the foregoing. Simmons, though, is no stranger to the world of politics or the media. Formerly working as a communications officer for Boris Johnson's Conservative Party and as an advocate for environmental causes. And as a couple, she's even credited with giving Boris Johnson a makeover. Ever since she came on the scene, he's become a much trimmer figure. He's lost weight. He's had his hair cut so he doesn't look quite dishevelled. Uh, he's definitely smartened up his appearance. So it's been a much more disciplined Boris Johnson that we've come to see. It will be uncharted territory for the couple and the country as Britain's new Prime Minister carries out some duties that would normally include a spouse. Although Simmons' presence on his first day suggests he's not alone and he may need that support given the daunting challenges he faces, not least Brexit. This can be a very solitary e existence and I think all Prime Ministers need to have a partner that they can not just rely on but maybe consult on some things and I think she will be a real rock for him in many ways. Johnson may also now be relying on Carrie Simmons to be his rock for turbulent times. And if the Prime Minister and his girlfriend choose to take their relationship further, well, the world may witness the first wedding of a sitting Prime Minister in over 200 years. That also sounds familiar. Anna Stewart there in London at 25 minutes past six. Temperature records have been broken once again across Europe as a searing heat wave rolls over the continent for the second time this summer. The mercury reached a scorching 42.6 degrees in Paris. That's the hottest it's ever recorded in the French capital. Uh, Britain recorded its second hottest day ever at 38.1 degrees. Records have also tumbled in Belgium, Germany and the Netherlands. And forecasters say that globally this month is set to be the hottest July on record. The ABC's Linton Besser has this report. In Munich, kids flocked to local pools as temperatures in Germany soared to a new record of 41 and a half degrees. In Paris, the fountains in front of the Eiffel Tower were turned into free water parks. Anything to escape the 42 degree day. And in Belgium, meteorologists like Alex de Walk were reaching for the record books. This is, these are the highest recorded temperatures for Belgium in history since the beginning of the measurement in 1833. Meanwhile, in the UK, locals were bracing for the worst. Services were cancelled on 20 out of 26 rail lines for fear of train tracks buckling in the heat. Charities were handing out water and sunscreen to the homeless. And the government issued a level three heat alert for parts of the country that's one level below the formal declaration of a national emergency. At a heaving takeaway shop in Hyde Park, Ben spent the day flipping burgers and frying chips. If it was hot outside, it was even worse behind the grill. Forecasters had promised the hottest day ever recorded in the United Kingdom and Ben came prepared. His shop is on the edge of a modest lake in the middle of Hyde Park. Well, on a hot day like this, I've decided to do what everyone else does in central London when it's boiling. Can't go to the beach. There's not much air conditioning around. So I've come to Hyde Park, to the Serpentine, which is a very green pond through the middle of Hyde Park. And there's a mass of humanity swimming at the Lido which is a fenced off section of the pond and you have to pay for access to it. On the shore of the Serpentine, I met Emily and Millie, 
They've just returned to London after two and a half years of living in Sydney. Um, and we've come back about a month ago now. But we've come down for a swim and are shocked that people are paying to get in this water. I mean, have a look. It's absolutely revolting. <laughs> Hello, Bertie. <laughs> Another local woman, Lucy, wasn't put off in the slightest. I think they treat the water so it's safe, but some people won't go in that because they think, oh, this is really gross. But we, we don't mind at all. We just This is like our local beach because we live in the centre of London. We are not prepared for heat. No. This, is, this is a real rarity, so it's quite exciting. Hence, everybody is out in their bikinis. A Londoner trying to keep cool, ending that report from the ABC's Linton Besser. Royal Canadian Mounted Police believe they're closing in on two teenagers wanted in relation to the killings of three people, including an American woman and her Australian boyfriend. They're using drones and dogs to scour harsh terrain in Manitoba, where the teens burnt out an abandoned car was found earlier this week. They were originally reported as missing, but later named as suspects in the killings. The CBC's Angela Johnson reports from the tiny town of Gillam in northern Manitoba. On a remote gravel road near Gillam, a heavy-duty RCMP vehicle rushes by. It's flanked by a drone team and a convoy of trucks, including a few locals who took a detour on their way to go fishing, but also just want to see what's going on. We were going to check a net, and we saw that vehicle come by, a bunch of vehicles behind that armoured one in the front, and then a bunch of vehicles behind it. Uh, those guys all camoed out, so we thought we'd come check it out. In this area today, it's a mix of curiosity and nerves. Even like just, you know, going out checking nets, like you got to be really on edge. No idea where these guys are, so I've really been like nervous like that. Corporal Julie Kershane with the RCMP says this is still a dynamic and unfolding situation. And we can now confirm that there have been two established and corroborated sightings of the suspects in the Gillam area. These sightings were prior to the discovery of the burnt out vehicle. There have also been no reported stolen vehicles that could be attributed to the suspects. At this point in the investigation, we believe they are still in the area. Billy Beardy steps over to a charred area of brush. A burned out SUV was removed from the area. The one that the RCMP say Cam McLeod and Briar Schmigelski were driving. Beardy spotted the black smoke and flames on Monday night when he was out with his wife and six-year-old daughter. He says they had no idea how close they might have come to running into the suspects. We sat here for like 45 minutes before anyone even got here. They could have been... That was the CBC's Angela Johnson reporting there from Gillam, Manitoba. Sorry to cut that short, but the Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, has arrived there at Auckland Airport and is just starting to make some comments about Ihu Matau. We'll just cross live there now. As members of the government, um, over at least the past week, that things have um, escalated in recent times uh, in the dispute um, that we've seen around uh, the housing development uh, in uh, South Auckland. Uh, we had met yesterday, uh, ministers met yesterday, to talk about ways to help facilitate um, a way forward. Uh, we've brought that conversation forward today. Um, so this afternoon there was a meeting that did involve mana whenua, ourselves as government, to help broker a solution. And also, of course, Fletcher's were at the table, as was Mayor Philgoff and members of council. You know, it was clear to all of us, we have heard here the strong voice of young people, the, the rangatahi, who feel a really strong connection um, to the land and feel very strongly about the issues that are being raised here. At the same time, of course, we hear the perspective of mana whenua, who do want to see um, their people housed on uh, ancestral land. So those are, of course, the two competing tensions that we hear. Uh, we see the role that we have to play as government. We haven't been directly involved in this dispute, but we do believe that we can try and help facilitate a solution. Off the back of the meeting today, um, as of now, there will be um, no building activity on the land while we take the time to try and work through a solution and find a solution. Uh, our expectation is, off the back of conversations today, that uh, over the course of the week, conversations hui will be, have, uh, will be had amongst iwi, particularly obviously those who have an interest um, with strong leadership, obviously, from mana whenua. Um, but we also understand that there will be um, conversations with those who are currently occupying the land as well, that they will be part of the dialogue. Uh, tomorrow, um, Ministers Hinare 
and Minister Willie Jackson um, will go down to the site, will talk to those young people who are there. The request that we make at this time though is while we try and work through brokering a solution, that I understand that young people will be joining um, and that a large number of people are suggesting that they will travel um, to the land. We just ask that they be respectful, that they just look after um, that the land that they will be visiting, that they uh, just respect as well that there are Komatua, Kuia, Tamariki, children and older people where that's their home and just to make sure that everyone is looking after one another uh, while they're having their voice heard. Um, my hope is that it's peaceful, that it's respectful. In the meantime, we will continue to do what we can to facilitate dialogue and to find uh, a way through um, uh, this uh, discussion and the dispute that's been had. I'm going to now um, give a chance to um, uh, Minister Nanaia Mahuta, who obviously has a role here both with an interest in papakaianga housing, um, to talk a little bit about who was at the meeting today um, and also some of the content of what was discussed. Ministers Henare and Minister Will, uh, Jackson will then have a chance to talk about uh, what they expect tomorrow as we move ahead and try and find uh, a peaceful resolution. First of all, we'd like to... OK, that's Jacinta Ardern, the Prime Minister, talking to Auckland Airport, not too far from Ihu Mātao and the Otua Tahi, uh, to, sorry, Otua Toha um, Stone Fields Reserve there in Mangare, near the airport. Now, she mentioned a few things. The, probably the first thing was just to acknowledge the young people at Rangataki who had expressed themselves in such passion there over the last few days um, and have made their voices heard. But she did say that those interests must be balanced with those of the mana whenua, people who have done a deal with Fletcher Construction about the, that building project uh, worth about 500 homes. And she said those people, the mana whenua, do want to see their people housed on ancestral land. Um, so the Prime Minister is saying in the next few days there will be many hui, including the people on the site, uh, particularly the people with interest in the land. Uh, and there will be co uh, conversations uh, with those who are currently occupying the land. Uh, she did say that two government ministers, Penny Henare and Willie Jackson, will be there as early as tomorrow uh, talking with people on site. Uh, and she did warn young people and other people travelling uh, to Ihu Matau uh, in the next few days just to be respectful of the people that are there, to be concerned obviously that the numbers are climbing and uh, just to look after one another was her call and the government will be facilitating a dialogue. That's all we've got time for today. Thanks for sticking with us at Checkpoint. Have a wonderful weekend. Takita Ano. RNZ News headlines. Good evening. The Prime Minister has just been speaking about the Ihumato land dispute, saying two ministers will go to the site tomorrow to speak to protesters as the government tries to broker a solution. A jury at the High Court in Hamilton has found two men guilty of the kidnapping and manslaughter of 26-year-old Mitchell Patterson and a woman guilty of kidnapping.